Shelley, thanks for coming in today. Um, we've recently been told about this atrial fibrillation that you have. Uh, how are you doing with that? Well, I notice it once in a while, but I'm doing pretty good. Okay. All right. Well, as, as your doctor told you, uh, um, uh, this atrial fibrillation can be associated with an increased risk for stroke. And uh, we're, we're having you in today to talk about options to reduce that risk. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, we can, we can kind of estimate your, uh, more your individual risk by using a tool that I'm going to go over with you here. Um, it takes into account several factors that uh, sometimes help us in categorizing your individual risk. Um, certainly gender does. You're, you're 55 and, and, and that plays a, a little role in your risk. And, uh, understand you have um, blood pressure medications you take for that. None of these other things other than your diabetes, which is very well controlled by the way, but uh, that is a risk factor. Now with this tool and based on studies that have been done on patients like you, we're able to estimate the overall risk somebody like you might have for having a stroke. We'll take a look at that on this next panel. Okay. So again, over a five year period, Somebody with your risk factors and atrial fibrillation, up to six patients might have a disabling stroke. Another 11 would have a non-disabling stroke. Okay. But 83 would not have a stroke in that population over five years. And I really can't tell you which of these patients you would be over those five years. We aren't able to predict that any more than what we have with this, with this tool. But that would be your risk over time. Anticoagulant medications are used to decrease that risk, and uh, the, we, we have several choices, but in general, they have a similar effect on reducing that risk, and I can show you that right here. So if you were on anticoagulant medication, that risk, that risk of a fatal or disabling stroke would go from six down to two. The risk of a, a, a non-disabling stroke would go from 11 down to eight. And that would mean that about seven patients out of those 100 patients over five years would, would not experience a stroke because they were on the anticoagulant medication. Okay. Okay. Is that something that makes sense for you? Well, I think so. I mean, in my age, I, I want to, you know, live my life to the fullest. So if I can eliminate that stroke. Yeah. And again, it's not, it's not complete, but it's pretty good at lowering the risk. And so... Uh, why don't we talk about these drugs and, and how they're used and, and how they compare because we do have some choices now. Um, there's a standard uh, long-term drug that we've used, Warfarin, you may know it as Coumadin, um, uh, that's been used for this purpose. And uh, recently, over the last four to five years, we've had several new drugs that work quite differently um, uh, that have been approved for this and, st and studies show they work at least equally well. Those are called direct anticoagulants. There are several types, but we'll talk mostly about them as a category versus a warfarin in this. Okay. Okay. All right. So you've got options, which is always a nice thing. So there are several concerns that patients might have as far as uh, uh, taking these medications and what effect uh, it has on their life. Is there any particular concern that you have? Well, I know that um, with my current medications that I typically always take my first morning pills. And in the evening, you know, I might be busy and I forget sometimes. So, so once a day seems to be day. more important for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll let you know that the warfarin and coumadin is a once a day pill. Okay. Um, it's different. And these new medications, there are a couple of them that are twice a day pills. But we do have a couple that are once a day pills too. One thing I'll point out is the warfarin does require regular testing because we're testing the level of their clotting factors, and that that, that sometimes is a is a bother for patients. Although it usually settles out to once or twice a month testing, but there are blood tests that are associated with this, except for some yearly screening tests. We don't do uh, uh, any blood testing uh, to monitor the levels of these newer drugs. Okay. Uh, you know, my veins are really hard to find. I, I really don't like blood testing. So that, that, you know, sounds pretty good with the newer medications so far. Uh, any other of these issues? Um, diet? Uh, cost? Well, 
tell me more about the interaction between the diet and medications. The warfarin works through this vitamin called vitamin K, and um, if you have very erratic or inconsistent vitamin K intake, that'll affect the warfarin. So we really promote a consistent diet, uh, not heavy on the vegetables, but if you don't avoid vegetables, just have a consistent amount. As well, if you, if you get sick and you're not absorbing food very well, that can affect it too. What about alcohol? Alcohol affects the warfarin uh, uh, metabolism, and that can cause the, the, the uh, uh, warfarin to go off. Uh, alcohol also can increase your risk for bleeding. I'll just point that out, too. So heavy use of alcohol is something we try to avoid anyway. Okay. The direct anticoagulants don't have any food interactions. Okay, so there are no dietary restrictions that you have to worry about. They, they have some medication interactions, but they're, they're, they're less common. Well, let's talk about cost because, you know, I'm on a budget. All right. Like most people. Yeah. Well, there's a big difference in the cost because the warfarin is generic. It's fairly inexpensive. And we estimate over over a year that the cost of the warfarin would be about five to $600 a year. And that includes the testing. Um, a lot of things are covered by insurance. This is just the cost if you didn't have insurance. And the new drugs are quite expensive. Uh, they, they can be up to close to $3,000 a year. Again, most patients who go on the new drugs, is, you know, they have coverage by their insurance and have varying amounts of copay with the new drugs and stuff, but uh, usually it, it, for the patients who go on the new drugs, it's not as expensive as it would be out of pocket. Well, our insurance covers quite well. Um, I'd like to see what the newer drugs would, would cost for me, um, just because I don't like to go in for blood testing that often. And, and I like to have wine once in a while and not worry that it's gonna alter my medications. Okay. Well, I, I kind of feel obligated to kind of let you know that any of these medications can increase your risk for bruising um, and bleeding. Um, maybe, you know, uh, uh, up to not eight or nine more patients a year can have bleeding episodes. Or, or I'm sorry, eight or nine over five years can have bleeding episodes. But, uh, um, there's risk for bleedings even if you're not on those medications. Um, and that's that's something that, you know, we always want to make sure patients are aware of. We actually educate you on ways to avoid bleeding and ways to, to recognize bleeding and all these measures. So all in all, do you feel like being on one of these medications makes sense for you? Uh, I do. Okay. And you said earlier that you were kind of interested in one which one of these were you more interested the in? Newer the newer medications. Ones? Okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that more. Well, we can check out, uh, uh, we'll talk about the new medications and pick one that you might be interested in and then check out the price. Okay. okay.